Thank you, Mick. I made Mick promise that she wouldn't say she gave a year of her life to living in Canberra and she hated every minute of it, so that is a much better review than we deserve. For Canberra, obviously, not my program. Hi. So, I wanted to do three things in the next 10 minutes and counting. I want to briefly introduce you to cybernetics. I want to tell you a little bit about systems. And I want to locate all of that in the context of how it is that we talk about deep technology. So I want to take a step back. And I want to tell you two really quick stories. One of them starts in 2003, when a man named William Gibson, some of us will know William Gibson, uh, famous science fiction author, gave us the phrase cyberspace, wrote a series of, yeah, cyberpunk novels, if you want to kind of think about it that way. And in 2003, long after he'd invented a series of terms that really shaped much of the world we live in, he was asked by a journalist from The Economist magazine to tell that journalist what was in the future. And I know what the journalist asked him. The journalist said, Bill, tell us about the future. And you know the journalist wanted some long, belabored description of blinky lights, possibly quantum, certainly 4G. He wanted to be told about technology. And what Gibson said instead was, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And what he meant by that was two very different provocations. Provocation number one was to say, stop imagining that the future is a destination that you're going to arrive at, at some later point in time. The future's not a destination, it's not a stable, knowable thing. Provocation number one. Provocation number two is that what Gibson is also saying is if you look really hard around you, you should be able to see the future peeking through in the present. To be able to do that well means you have to learn to hone your skills to see the future in the present. You've all been incredibly lucky for this morning because what you got to see on this stage was the future peeking through in the present. But I can tell you as someone who spent much of my career attempting to explain the future to people in the present, it doesn't always go so well. In that same period of time when Gibson was talking to The Economist magazine, I found myself at Intel where I was a researcher and I had a photograph that one of my amazing colleagues here in Australia had taken of a train platform in Tokyo full of people with mobile phones with their heads down over those phones because of course it's 2003 and it's Docomo and every one of those phones is connected to a data network and a data system, and they're doing location-based services and location-based dating and location-based, location-based, like all of it. And we brought this photo and those stories back to the man I worked for who was the vice president of research in that company, and he said to me, eh, that's just Japan. And I'm like, yeah, no, I get that. It is just Japan, and the Japan, are, you know, Tokyo, kind of cool, but I think this is a thing. He's like, no, no one wants to do that with their phones. He's like, why would you want to do those things with your phones? I mean, like, phones are just making calls, right? All that other stuff, that's computers. I'm like, I think it's the future. And he was like, yeah, nah. These days, he does admit that he was wrong. It took him a long time. And what's really clear to me when I think back about that moment was I clearly saw the future peeking through in the present, and I couldn't work out how to make it clear to him that that's what it was. And part of the reason for that, I suspect, was that I kept trying to talk about the future as though it was a device. And what was really happening in Tokyo in that moment in time was a system, not a device. It wasn't just about a phone, it was about a network. It was about a data system, it was about a series of applications and services that were going to flow on that system. It was about all of those things. And the limits of my vocabulary in 2003 were that I only knew how to talk about the future in bits and pieces. Well, literally, I was in a tech company, so bits. Thinking about it as a system, as a system of people and stuff and the place it was happening, I didn't have that vocabulary. Which is funny, because that vocabulary has also been around for a really long time. So story number two. If that's the 2003 story, there's a 1948 story. Because there's always a 1948 story. Back in 1948, in New York City, a group of people gathered in a hotel room to talk about the future. Immediately before they gathered in that hotel room, they are looking at the world around them. They're looking at computational power getting more and more significant, literally week by week. The ENIAC in the last presentation with those two excellent women programmers in the foreground of it, that's what computing looked like in 1948. But geez, it was getting more powerful. 
with every passing minute, and people were litigating and worrying about what would computing bring, what would be the consequences of all that computing power, who was going to have it, what were they going to do with it, was it going to change the way we worked, was it going to change the way we lived, was it going to result in more violence? These should sound like familiar conversations. And in 1948, a whole group of people in that hotel room in New York City were arguing about what the future should be. And they were trying to find a language to talk about it. A language that would let them talk about computers, but not just as devices, and talk about people, not just as programmers, and talk about the police it was all happening. And remember, in 1948, you have the entire of World War II sitting right behind you. And you were wondering if that is the world you were going to make with computational technology. For that group of people in 1948, the language they found themselves was the language of cybernetics. They created the word, cybernetics. Turns out, parenthetically, I only work in places where we invent terms. So all my favorite ideas are invented terms. The internet, electricity, telegraphy, typewriters, robots, cyberspace, cybernetics. They're not unrelated. But there they were in 1948 saying, how do we create a vocabulary that lets us talk about the relationship between the human and the technical. The word they go looking for is a Greek word. The word is kybernets, or to steer. And when it's mobilized in Greek, it literally means to be in a boat, Mick. To be in a little tiny boat. I suspect a tinny, although they didn't have those in ancient Greece. <laughs> but a little tiny boat where you can feel the movement through your hand, because your hand is on the till in a little tiny boat where you can see yourself moving, where the water is clear, the boat is clear, and you are clear. And that relationship between you, the boat, the water, and what it means to move the till and have the boat move is the idea that sat behind cybernetics. The idea that we should work out how to think not just about the pieces, the till, the metal, the boat, maybe an engine, but about the human, what it means to move that boat, what it means to steer it, what it means to navigate it through water, smooth or rough, and that whole idea that it wasn't just about the components, it was about the relationships between them, about the feedback loops that sat between those relationships, about how you imagined control. In that instance, how do you control a boat in the water as a human? Well, sometimes you don't. That notion became the idea of cybernetics. And under that banner of cybernetics, over a 20-year cycle, people argued about computers and human beings, they created the entire category of artificial intelligence, because the same people who were talking about the future of computing in 1948 go on to coin the term artificial intelligence in 1956. The same people who are at that event run off to England and dabble in digital art and make a whole lot of things we're deeply familiar with. Some of those people then dabble in more art and give us David Bowie. I love any field that starts in 1948 with a word and ends up with David Bowie. In the other direction, it goes to the West Coast and gives us design thinking radical ecology, and the internet. So, 1948, the word, and the word is cybernetics, a way of thinking about systems. 2003, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. 2023, the question is, what are the tools we need to think about where we have been, where we are, and where we are going? And for me, those tools are always about how we think at a systems level. How do we not think about just the computer, just the boat? How do we not just think about the human, but how do we think about the relationships between all of those things? Because frankly, if we think about the kind of challenges we have right now in 2023, they're not just technology challenges, they're not just human challenges, they're not just ecological challenges, they're the pieces that sit at the intersections of all of those. So how we find a vocabulary to talk about that, how we find a way to train ourselves up to move through this, is about how we think about artificial intelligence systems, how we think about quantum systems, how we think about environmental systems, transportation systems, electrical grids, all of it. So, we run a program, the focus on all that stuff. There was a slide earlier, because my slides are desperately out of order here. There was a slide earlier that said you should come join us, Mick helpfully advertised. I decided in 2021 that that idea of cybernetics needed to be reanimated for the 21st century. I figured we weren't done with the idea of a way of talking about the future that let us pull together people, humans, and the environment. So we started a school. We are at the Australian National University. That school is the first new school they've started in 40 years. The too long don't read story there is don't start a new school at a university in the middle of a pandemic. 
turns out it's hard and people are kind of hostile. Uh, better news is if you're going to do it, it might as well be me doing it because I don't know how to take no for an answer in that particular context. So we have a school, we have a graduate program, we have a PhD program, we teach short courses. But most importantly, what we do is passionately advocate for the idea that we need to talk about systems, not just technology, and that in talking about systems, we have to talk about people too. So that's what I wanted to tell you. But before I leave, I want to do what for me is the most important thing I get to do since coming back to Australia seven years ago, which is acknowledge where I am today, on the lands of the Gadigal people. I want to pay my respects to elders past and present. I want to acknowledge all the First Nations people who are in this room. I want to reflect that the work I do happens on Ngunnawal and Nambra country. And I want to be really mindful of the fact in this year in particular, what it means to acknowledge country is part of a much broader system, a system that is about, well, a statement from the heart five years ago, a system that's about a call for treaty and voice and truth, a system that demands all of us not just to begin our conversations with acknowledgement, but actually actively work to change the system in which that takes place.